that's what has fueled all um, you know the great discoveries is that there's there's first an intuition about something that that scientists may not exactly know why they have it and and that that's that's what right. is, is happening here and 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 it's worth um, pursuing if there are anomalous phenomena taking place that are outside our general understanding because we said that's not supposed to happen based on our understanding of physics and it just sounds seems like it's it's outside the everyday experience could it be that what we're experiencing is something that we normally would not readily observe you take you take the the, the contents of of this great piece of material he changes the velocity in which the electron flow. That's what, what makes it colder and warmer. Everything is already here. We have to put it together. We still haven't gotten beyond that yet. That's what we're about to do now. We are going to get to the, elite, the uh, equilibrium of what he's trying to do. I'm Clark Vanish, professor of mathematics. And for about uh, 20 to 30 years, we've done a lot of simulation and uh, working with a lot of the local uh, companies, um, NASA, as well as uh, Northrop and Rockwell in space generation. Uh, my favorite field is mathematics, and it is my field. So. Hi, my name is Amar Vakil, and my background is in uh, computational forensics. I've been pursuing that for the last 20 years. I was a former principal investigator at JPL, NASA. Uh, There's a research collaboration through what I do. And I hold a, I have, I have a background, I'm a part-time professor at Southern California Institute of Technology. Uh, and I have a bachelor's in electronics technology and associate nurse in mathematics. Uh, board certified with the, uh, board certified with the California Board of Professional Engineers and Land Survey Surveyors. My name is Matthew Pulver. Uh, I studied math and physics. I was with the Quantum Computing Research Group at UCLA. Um, I did some uh, fundamental publications in that field. Um, past 20 years, have been doing computer programming, computer modeling, been working closely with Paul Laviolette in particular, and um, actually proving some of his hypotheses of um, particle formation in terms of uh, reaction diffusion systems and modeling them on a computer. We're here to present a, a, uh, an academic preview of John Searle, uh, work on what he has been trying to do for the last, uh, how long it's been, since the 1940s, in an area that is uh, difficult to discuss because it, it borders on the fringes of science and technology. And there's some kind of ordering principle involved. I mean, that, that, that's the direction that, um, I guess, is kind of the, the, the uh, the forefront of the list of hypotheses, I guess, that, that I'm, I'm holding, at the same time being open to, to anything new, um, that it's, yeah, that there is an ordering principle that is, it is actually an exception to the second law of thermodynamics. And, you know, that, that's only a, a statistical law. I mean, it's, I know this is a kind of a crude analogy, but, I mean, it's, you take any, any statistic, you're going to find systems that can be way outside of the the you know the 99.99 percent of of that especially if you're doing something right especially if you have a certain information or there's just some kind of new ordering principle that we didn't know before whenever you change the molecular structure of something it will change so the molecular structure of some of the particles that this, that we deal with the, for Searle uh, is, is changing, is to us, is nothing, but it, it's a lot to the, the electrons themselves. Because um, you you talk about, you think that uh, when, when something speeds up, you expect it for it to get hotter, or you, you felt something cooler when you, when you try to, when you're down in San Diego. The molecular structure has changed. And, and that's what causes that. And now, when it doesn't have to break as break is, but it has changed, and that's what's happening in there that, that we don't see, quote unquote, the naked eyes. When we look at the law of squares, we can see 
right away when we look at a magic square as as what how it, how it could be de described. All the rows and all the columns they all add up to the same number. Uh, that itself, there when you see when you see when nature is trying to sing to you, and that's kind of what some folks would say. You, you know, you see this these patterns. It's very intriguing for me mathematically to look at it as as Professor Clark as Clark mentioned. Uh, it, it's something that it, as if as if nature's pulling pulling on you. Said, hey, you know, you got to take a look at this. This is interesting. Say you've, this is on a, an object on a plane. Right. If I have a force coming this way and a 90 degree force coming this way, and I want to know what is the net force on this object, even though they're at, they're at 90 degrees, what I would still do is add do a vector addition here to find that then it's going to net go in this direction. Right. That's the result of that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so the question in, in in that terms, you know, I, I do I do this operation on two vectors, which is addition in this case, to get a third vector. And the meaning of that is that that is the net force on this object. Mm -hmm. So the similar question, when, when, you crop, when you take two magnetic flux fields, yes. right, you take the cross product, what is the meaning of that? Because we, we, yeah, we could take any, any, any two vectors and do any number of, you know, we could do a, a, what, like a tensor inner outer product even or whatnot. Right, um, right. What, what, so that, that's what I'm wondering, like what, what is the meaning of that operation physically? I don't know what is the, what exact, exactly happening, but I do know that they are crossing each other at 90 degrees. What we're doing is we're getting some kind of a phenomena taking place here. What, whether this phenomena is trivial or not, the issue is, is that what is going on behind, the, what, behind it. And what I'm, all I'm saying is, son of a gun, these two fields are crossing each other at 90 degrees. Wow. Now, I can at least see, I can model that. They have magnitude, they have direction. I said that itself is interesting just to write down. And I do. I write it down. Do I know what the meaning of it is? The answer is no. I don't know what the meaning of it is. I do know that it produces some kind of an effect. Would this also <laughs> apply to if I had two magnets mm -hmm. and that I put them in a certain position so that, say, the magnetic field it's like you have, a, you have a north magnetic field line represented by my fingers. You have another north magnetic field line represented by my, by my fingers. Mm -hmm. You put them together and you have, you have them cross at 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Then is that the same situation? I mean, would to here or no? Because what what what's different is here is that you have one of them, which is a stator magnetic field that is radially coming out. So if you were to look at its uh, surface, because it's a flux magnetic, it's the, the intensity times the area uh, cross, cross section of the area. So what you're looking at is a two pi, two pi radius cross section, and that two pi radius, when it, when that thing comes out, it's getting it's getting lower intensity as you go further and further out, but it is stronger in at, at the at the center. And what I'm noticing is that the input of these two fields crossing each other at 90 degrees, at magnitude and direction, and the fact that you're getting an output voltage and an output current, where the current continues to increase and the voltage can remain re reasonably constant. In fact, I'd say it's, it remains constant for the sake of argument, causing that resistance, and, and yet the resistance starts dropping. What it's telling me is that the ratio of the two, the input of those two fields crossing each other, and the output is telling me delta E delta T. There are two ways of looking at it. And you, you have a resistor, and then you have a voltage. Uh, just, just call it V. And, and we, I, I'm not, you know, to me, I, I, I like both directions. You know, you can look at the whole flow, which is coming down. This is the whole flow. And, and then, of course, you have the electron flow, which is... So, to me, both of them are useful for different purposes. That's how I see it as an engineer. Some, sometimes this is more convenient to work with, sometimes this is more convenient. Right now, I'm going to look at it from this end because we, that's exactly what's moving. In, in Searle's device. So I'm going to look at the electron flow design. So what, what we, now you can look at this re ground as just a reference. It's just a starting point. This is where it's coming. This is where the lower potential is. So there's a pressure for these electrons to bang into each other. Excuse me. They want to they collide into each other to send a signal so that ultimately you're getting a voltage up here. So there's a potential. In Searle's device, 
if you had a ground like this, there's a problem. You don't have, this resistor generates heat. In Searle's device, no heat. There is something going on here. I put a question mark there. So as an investigator, my job is to do the following. I know this, I know this, but I don't know this part here. This is what I don't know. That everything outside this, all this stuff, I'm going to shade here. I don't know this. This is, I don't know. Don't know. I don't understand. Don't, this area is unknown. Let me just say unknown. Spell that. So this question mark falls out here. But what I do work with is what I can see. What I see in Searle's device, if you have Searle's device, Searle's device is essentially is a set of rings and then you have rollers and then you have another set of rings and then you have another set of rollers. Uh, okay, let's say this is the, you can keep doing this, but let's say out here you have C, you have what they call C-coil C uh, uh, ca capacitors, they're, they're C, C caps that are that these rollers can pass through. I hope I, I'm not I'm not. It's kind of hard to draw all these things pretty quickly, but I'll just keep it simple. So let's say this is the outer outer rim. Um, you can look at this just like a standard circuit, except it's different. That's the problem. It doesn't behave the same way. Now. Of course, we haven't got to the point where, like I said, there, this, was a, this was a phenomenon that Searle had observed. Uh, I think it was in the early 40s, uh, and the, in the 50s, 60s, and, and the, also in the 70s, he had experienced this phenomenon. Our job as investigators is to see if this did happen, and if we were to replicate this thing, can we arrive at the same conclusions he arrived at? Can we experience what he experienced? But we're going to do it. Uh, using some conventional understanding we have here, and then to take it to the next step. There was a famous physicist, he, he's a, someone I really admire, his name was Richard Feynman. He was being interviewed at one point, and he, someone asked uh, Richard Feynman, said, well, you know, how do you feel about all this? And he said, well, one of the things is that when we deal with physics, uh, we sometimes have the answers. We have the mathematics defined, but it, it, it sometimes there's more than one solution out there. There might be 15 solutions, and our mathematics tells us, yeah, it's all all 15. But but sometimes to make that connection between what we're experimenting experimenting with and also what our final answers are, we still seem to have to create a scaffolding to go from here to that side. Similarly, in Searle's phenomena, Searle's case, he has some very interesting interesting mathematics. There's a lot of consistency in it. That self-consistency has that self-consistency is very enticing for anyone to continue to pursue this. But the problem is, is there's this big, big gap between over there and over here, and how to do a scaffolding from here to on that side is almost like doing acrobats. So we almost have to be on the verge of speculation, intelligent speculation. It may not give us all the answers. It may not. It, I might even be wrong about all this. But, the, but as far as how I'm about going about doing this, but what I'm saying is, is that if we can look at this, examine this just like a circuit, but we're going to leave this part alone. We're going to look at it like a question mark. Can we assemble a model? Can we assemble a mathematical model that can illustrate what R is? See, here R is equal to V over I in Ohm's law, okay? But here, could R be equal to something similar to that. What we're doing right now is inductively speculating what could be going on. If the phenomena is very unusual, then could it be that also it will require an unusual explanation to the extent that we have to go down to the deeper innards of quantum mechanics to question the idea of what matter really is? Could time itself become part of that process?